Diana and Pauline call 911. The boys are barely clinging to life. They are rushed to Atlanta's Children's Hospital, one by sky, the other by ambulance, both in a coma. During their stay, a woman of no relation to the curious, a supposed friend to Jane, starts spending a lot of time with the boys in the hospital. Darley taking on the role as the curious spokeswoman, winning over the trust of Jane's mother, and was somehow able to gain guardianship of Jeremy. Peter, after a week in a coma, wakes up. And a few weeks later, Jeremy regains his consciousness, both having no immediate memory of what happened. Once they were able to leave, Jane's mother and Jeremy move in with Elizabeth. Wasting no time, she sells Jane's house, her car, and all her earthly possessions, supposedly placing their money in trust accounts. Jeremy would ask Liz many times about those accounts. Her response, always the same, I'll tell you later. As later became never, one red cent never touched his hand. She was never nurturing or a motherly figure, Jeremy says. She ran her household more like a principal. Strict and emotionless, Jeremy had to ask to do everything, doing nothing without her permission. However, Elizabeth was never named as a suspect. On the detective search for answers, they obtained 60 days of Jane's phone records. They discover every day, 10 to 15 times without fail, Jane talks to her handyman on the phone, a guy named Patrick from her church. Suspiciously, July 30th at 10 p.m. will be their last communication over the phone. Zero calls on the 31st, no calls on August 1st. Why this sudden change? The pattern was broken around the same time that Jane was unalive. When questioned by detectives, he says he doesn't know why he stopped calling and almost seeming to deflect attention, he tells about a conversation that he allegedly had with Jane. According to Patrick, she told him that her husband was actually unalive by the Mungiki gang, or as some call it, the Kenyan Mafia. Notable, Elizabeth and Patrick both attended the same church as the Curious. Detectives discovered that Jane had loaned Patrick a large sum of money totaling $5,000. They questioned Patrick again, but he was calm, cool, and collected. No stress at all. No panic, so they did not push the issue. Strange, Patrick alleges that she was not even pressuring him to pay back the money. So that couldn't have been what all of those phone calls were about. They also found jumbled up paper on the table across from where she was murdered, with numbers equaling to the sum of $5,000. After Jane and the girls were buried, the family loses contact with Patrick. They never talked to him again. Two miles from where the attacks occurred, bloody hands house were found in a ditch. Authorities believe that these were thrown out from the curious scene. But under civil liberty protection, investigators are prevented from running the profiles of all convicted felons through the DNA database, meaning the answers in this case could be all a matter of forbidden science. According to some reports, Jane was about to receive a large sum of money. This was unable to be completely ruled out considering that Jane had an account in Kenya that is inaccessible by American authorities. Without closure, the door remains open. Without justice, these hearts will never be mended. I am but a voice, but today the voiceless have spoken. Justice for the curious. For more on this story and others like it, please take a second, click this link and subscribe to my YouTube.